HMS Dreadnought would be the heaviest, fastest warship afloat. Her firepower was concentrated in 10 12-inch guns. To protect her magazine, she was wrapped with armor plate 11 inches thick. Below her waterline, 18 watertight compartments made her unsinkable. She carried torpedoes and was the first major warship to run on steam turbines, her eight engines propelling her at an unprecedented 21.6 knots. Andrew Gordon is an authority on Dreadnought. Dreadnought laid down the gauntlet to every major naval power in the world. They had now either to build Dreadnoughts themselves or relinquish major power status. Dreadnought changed everything. In America, Japan, and Germany, new battleships already approved were rushed into construction. The word dreadnought became synonymous with the new and more powerful battleships. Amazingly, one of dreadnought's near contemporaries survives to this day. She is the battleship Texas, launched in 1912. Moored along the Gulf Coast near Houston, the Texas stands as a monument to the thousands of battleship sailors who served with her from 1914 through two world wars. The guns on the Texas were controlled by primitive computers. Armor plate on her sides was a full 12 inches thick. Each turret was manned by 24 sailors who lived and worked in dark, cramped quarters. The Texas reminds us of the primitive conditions aboard the first modern battleship. Steve Nelson is an historian and head curator of the Texas. What makes the USS Texas so similar to HMS Dreadnought are these big guns. Now these are 14 inch guns, the Dreadnought had 12 inch guns. And the way these guns worked was that two crew members had to man this loading ramp that down into position. The 14 inch shell was rammed all the way up the breech. 400 pounds of powder was placed in behind the shell. The crew had to grab the ramp again, making sure that it breaks in the middle. Closing up, the breech was closed. The crew had to jump into tight confined spaces like this, buckle themselves in, and communicate with their crew members through this voice tube, ready to fire. Ironically, Dreadnought would never fire her great guns in anger. Yet, within the decade, her existence would propel the world into war. June 28, 1914. The Archduke of Austria and his wife are assassinated by anarchists. The world explodes into war. German submarines attack British merchant shipping. Then on May 30, 1916, the German fleet steams to sea for its first confrontation with England's Grand Fleet. The decade-long arms race approaches Armageddon. The dreadnoughts meet off the coast of the Danish peninsula called Jutland. 250 warships fight the greatest sea battle the world has ever seen. When it is over, 25 ships have been sunk, 8,465 men killed, over 1,000 wounded. John Samita is an historian and authority on the Battle of Jutland, as is Eric Grove. They are at Admiralty headquarters on London's Pall Mall. The problem to the people who sat in this room was that the battle had not succeeded in gaining the crucial objective, the destruction of the high sea fleet. The battle did succeed in proving that the dreadnoughts were vulnerable. The German reaction was to keep her battleships in port for the remainder of the war. The British had failed to win an overwhelming victory at Jutland because the success of their big guns at long distances in the smoke and haze was only two or three percent of hits 
to shots fired. The problem for the Royal Navy at the Battle of Jutland was her battle fleet was prepared before the war for a battle that was going to take place at a much lower ranges. The British were working on a system of firing battleship guns at very long ranges. It was based on the work of Arthur Hungerford Pollen, who created a primitive computer before the word computer had been invented. Pollen developed the idea of using very advanced range finders that were gyroscopically stabilized against the motion of his own ship, a very advanced analog computer, very advanced systems of transmitting the uh, calculations of that computer to the guns. The Pollen system would have greatly improved accuracy, but was too expensive and was rejected by the Admiralty. They'd been informed by their intelligence that the Germans intended to fight at very short ranges. Their intelligence was dead wrong. This raised huge question marks over the whole way the British Royal Navy did its business. Admiral Beatty was in close contact with the Board of Admiralty who sat in this room. He said, there's something wrong with our bloody ships today and something wrong with our system. In the closing days of World War I in the Adriatic Sea, an Italian speedboat fires its torpedoes at two Austrian dreadnoughts. A combat cameraman aboard the Tagetov watches as two milky white tracks head for the St. Stephen. These pictures document the first sinking of a battleship by a simple torpedo exploding below her armor belt, where she was to prove as vulnerable as any other ship. The primitive camera grinds on as nearly 1,000 men are lost. Days later, the war is over. The Allies and their defeated foe gather to set the terms of peace at Versailles. And as Germany's captured high seas fleet makes its way through internment at the Scapa Flow naval anchorage north of Scotland, a secret plan to seal its fate is already in place. On the morning of June 21, 1919, German sailors aboard their captured ships carry out their orders scuttling 51 vessels, including their prized battleships, rather than hand them over to England as prizes of war. Their rotting remains still litter the bottom of Scapa Flow. As the new decade gets underway, disarmament is the mood of the day,